But right now I'm going to turn it over to Janika Smith with Jefferson County Department of Health. Thank you, Don, for the introduction. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shonika Smith. I'm an employee with the Jefferson County Department of Health Watershed Protection Program. The Jefferson County Department of Health Watershed Protection Program provides stormwater services to Stormwater Management Authority Incorporated SWEMA members. SWEMA is a group of 22 cities that share costs to meet the requirements of the National Pollution Discharge Elimination System, MPDS permits, issued by Alabama Department of Environmental Management, ADEM, and the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA. And the listing of the 22 cities um, that are members of Stormwater Management Authority Incorporated are listed on jcdh.org's website, and that's the Health Department's website, jcdh.org. The MPDS permit provides and regulates the stormwater discharges for a municipal separate storm sewer system known as the MS4 in order to protect water quality and people's health. The services provided by the Jefferson County Department of Health Watershed Protection Program includes educational outreach, water monitoring, storm drain mapping, screening of outfalls, high risk inspections, stormwater hotline number, and record keeping applications. For anyone um, that would like to contact the hotline number, you can call 930-1999, and that's area code 205-205-930-1999. And that if you see runoff from a construction site, pollution or dumping in streams, odor or discoloration coming from a stream. And that number is also listed on the stormwater um, on the Jefferson County Department of Health Watershed Protection Programs um, page on our website. And even if you see um, any of those action items outside of a SWEMA member city, we still will refer them to the proper municipality to get that complaint taken care of. Um, now, without further ado, I would like to introduce our presenter for today, Dr. Jim Jacoby, and the title of his presentation is What's Bugging You? Dr. Jacoby is employed with the Alabama Cooperative Extension Systems as an extension plant pathologist. He has a BS in forestry from the University of Vermont and an MS in forest pathology from Clemson University and a PhD in plant pathology from Auburn University. For the last 20 years, he has managed the extension plant diagnostics laboratory at the Birmingham Botanical Gardens. Now I'd like to turn it over to you, Dr. Jacoby. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. We're gonna talk a little bit about common insect and disease um, problems that I see in landscapes. Probably these are gonna be um, trees and shrub problems that I'm, we're gonna be talking about today. And so let's get started. So when I, think about controlling diseases and in, in insect pests. What I'm relying on is a, is a system called integrated pest management, which combines multiple strategies to try to control pests and disease. You know, it's really unrealistic to completely eliminate disease in insects, especially when we're living in Alabama. So it, we wanna manage them and keep them to um, undamaging levels and Probably the most important, at least the first step in that process is to begin with accurate pest identification. And so that's what we're gonna be talking about. I'll show you a lot of pictures today, um, some examples that come into the lab typically, some unusual things that I've seen recently and, and things, and hopefully we'll, you'll learn something, we'll have a little bit of fun um, and, and become a better identifier of all those different things that we might see. Now, unfortunately, I could go on for hours with all the things that I would see during a year. So I've tried to narrow it down to, to some of the more common things. Um, and, and so here we go. You know, one of the important parts of IPM and in integrated pest management is to use pesticides only, um, only if those non-chemical controls are ineffective. And many times plant selection, choosing the right plants, putting the plant in the right place, and timely pruning and other you know, um, management practices can manage the disease and insect problems without having to resort to pesticides. And then if we need a pesticide, you know, choosing that least toxic pesticide first 
that'd be soaps, oils, horticultural oil, neem oil, and then microbials like spinosad products. Because these damage those, they're less toxic. So they damage the beneficial insects that help us manage these problems. They might not the beneficial insects always don't need, totally eliminate things, but they can they can be a good important um, partner in in landscapes. So again, the first thing to do you got to identify that problem, and I get a lot of things um, brought into the lab where I get pictures of things, and these are things that aren't really a disease or insect problem we need to worry about. So in this picture, this is what's called a slime mold. It's a type of organism that feeds on bacteria and fungi that live on plant surfaces in mulch and other areas. And this one's called chocolate tube slime mold, it's steminitis. And it makes these little hairs on the leaf. It could be on the ground. Um, I've seen it on siding and other places, but it's just using that, it's not hurting the plant at all. You can even see an area, um, over to the side over here where it's even kind of, you can brush it off and the leaf is perfectly green underneath it. Okay, here's something in the turf. This is um, what's called dead man's hand, scleroderma. It's a fungal uh, fungus that is often associated with tree roots and it produces this large, bigger than a potato softball size that will erupt out of the ground and it'll break open and release these spores in the center doesn't really hurt the turf, but it's one of those you're gonna bang it with your lawnmower. Um, you know, it's poisonous. I'm gonna dig this up and I'm gonna to toss it. And that's really the only thing you're gonna to need to do. Here's a disease that we often see in the springtime on a wide variety of plants. It occurs first on cedar trees or native Eastern red cedar, produces a fungal spores that are carried to quince and other related plants and causes this rust. Well, in this case, it's infected our common pear. And you can see these little structures almost like, like insect um, protruding out of there, but this is a rust and it's gonna be powdery orange, kind of like Cheetos dust. And unfortunately these pears will never make it, but it, it's, a, it's a disease that I'll see, and I've seen it a lot this spring, not only on things like pear, but I'll see it on hawthorns. I've seen it on, on crab apples. Um, and also just yesterday I saw it on some persimmon, some Japanese persimmon. So for the body of the, my presentation, I've kind of separated it out. I'm gonna look first at pests of azaleas, and then we're gonna move over to pests of roses, um, oak, and then finish up with some miscellaneous other things just uh, randomly selected. And so, what, Azaleas are a huge part of, of, of landscapes in our area. And there's a lot of pests and diseases that we'll see. And I've listed some of them here. Lace bugs is, is probably the number one thing that I'll see in, in samples that come into the lab. Azalea caterpillar is another one that I'll see. Bark scale, mites, leaf gall, dieback and root rot. These are all diseases and insects that I'll see in our area. I can't cover all of these today, so I've kind of narrowed it down. Um, and also you sometimes will see some other things that will pop up on azaleas and other plants. So in this picture on the, on the right-hand side, see that fluffy white cottony material on this stem? That's from plant hoppers, the flatted plant hopper. And I see this on a lot of shrubs in the spring, only lasts for a relatively short period of time. And I think people confuse this with mealybugs a lot of times, but they're plant hoppers. Um, if you disturb the branch, oftentimes you will see the, the insect, um, which is very, it's white to gray and it'll hop or, or, or jump. A lot of times I just take a, a strong stream of water from a hose to knock these off. Some of the other things we might be spraying for lace bugs will probably also control them. But this is something you'll see, um, late May into June, maybe into July, and you'll see this on, on, on new growth on a lot of different shrubs in your landscape, but it really doesn't cause a lot of damage. It's one thing to remember. So I've tried to, um, using some information from the University of Georgia, this is, a, a, we're going to talk about three things. We're going to talk about azalea lace bugs, leaf and flower gall, and azalea caterpillar. And this is, I've, uh, I've put it out into a calendar. 
kind of give you an idea of when to look for these things because it's it's important to kind of be looking for them at different times of the period. And if the real common things, if you know, okay, it shows up at this time of the year, this is when I need to, to look for it. This is when I need to treat for it. I think that'll help you a lot in, in, in doing a better job managing some of these problems. So lace bugs, um, they're gonna show up typically in, in March to April and they'll have multiple generations, two or more generations throughout the season. All the way up, I'll see these active until we get a hard frost in, in November. Um, leaf and flower gall is a springtime thing. It'll get on the new growth in the spring. So you're gonna see this March through May. And then azalea caterpillars, they're gonna be a late season thing. So mid to late summer, let's say late July into August through September. And if you look here, you got some letters too. And so S, that would be a, the preferred time to initiate treatment or to spray. P is just stands that I'm gonna in for that disease that attacks the leaf and flower gall. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna pick or prune off those those affected leaves. All right, so azalea lace bug. Well, probably you guys can can um, already guess lace bugs. They're called that because their wings resemble lace. And in the on the left hand side we have an adult lace bug. And then an immature nymph or, or um, the immature stage of the lace bug. And the adults are about an eighth of an inch long, pretty small. They're going to be on the back of the leaves typically. And you're also going to be able to identify by turning that leaf over, you're going to see these black fecal spots, which are little oil, almost like black little oil droplets that'll dry up and, and turn brown over time. But that's the way to identify besides seeing the lace bugs themselves. And like I said, in Alabama, we're going to have two, at least two generations, maybe three. Now, the damage from lace bugs, it looks bad, but it's not going to be fatal. What they do is those, they have piercing sucking mouth parts that suck out the sap from individual cells, leaving these little flecks, or what we call stippling, where you're going to have these, and those leaves then often turn bronze and, and look ugly. And so it's really important to treat them early because if you have that damage, it's going to stay throughout the entire season and you're going to have to look at those ugly azaleas. But if you can catch them early um, and at least eliminate those early generations, early generation, um, you're much better off. So for treatments, again, we're going to start with our softer materials. That would be like horticultural oil or insecticidal soap. But remember, these are on the back side of the leaves, so you get a, need to get under that foliage and, and direct your spray. Um, if, if those don't seem to work, and in some cases, azaleas lace bugs can be kind of hard to control, um, acephate, the bonine systemic insect killer as a spray, usually does a good job. Now, we can also use the systemic products um, like imidacloprid work really well, but I like to try to steer you towards either horticultural oil or insecticidal soap first and see if those will work because um, in, in imidacloprid can damage bees and other pollinators. And if you decide to use it, follow the label directions to the letter and definitely apply them after the plants bloom. Okay, the second thing on azaleas we're gonna talk about is leaf and flower gall. And this is a picture in the early spring, we're starting to get these light kind of apple green swellings on the leaves. And this is a fungal disease. It's caused by a fungus exobacidium. And it, it makes these soft, spongy growths or galls. Um, and they're almost fleshy in, in, in appearance. They can form primarily on leaves, but you might see them on the stems, the flowers, or even the seed pods. The good news, it only attacks the new leaves. The old leaves, the mature leaves are resistant. So it's, they're gonna get the tender new growth. And you're gonna see this more when we have cool, wet weather. That fungus likes those cool temperatures, uh, wet conditions, and it needs it to, um, to, um, to cause disease. During a dry spring, we're probably not gonna see a lot of this. All right, here's 
A little bit more on azalea leaf and flower gall. Again, it's very noticeable. These are on a deciduous azalea, and these were flowers that were infected. Again, they start out kind of like this, this, this apple green color. And over time or over the season, as, as it progresses, as we get into May, we'll get this white powdery later, almost like powdery mildew, but on the, it's where the, the spores are being produced on the outside of that gall. And really the only thing we need to do with leaf and flower gall is just pull or pick off those, those infected leaves and throw them in the garbage. We don't really need to spray fungicides. Um, and, and that's typically, I consider it a cosmetic um, disease. It looks bad, but it's really not a threat to the plant health. All right, the third one is azalea caterpillars. So in this picture on the, on the left, these are the young larvae and they're red to brown with white to yellow stripes. And then the full grown larva is red, has a red head, red legs, is black with white or yellow stripes. Um, and in a lot of times the, the adult, the, the bigger larva, not the adults, but the bigger larva, they'll, they'll, they'll have this defensive posture like this one in the picture. And they're, they're, they're trying to look scary to anything that's trying to eat it. Now, typically they're, they're very gregarious. They like to um, gather together in a herd like you saw in that first picture. So often on an azalea bush, they're in one area, so they can easily be picked off by hand if you want to try that. That'll work really well. You can shake the plant and then just, you know, crush them under your foot. You know, that's another way to, to take care of them. Um, if you want to use chemicals, remember that smaller caterpillars are a lot easier to kill. And my first choice is going to be the microbial product Spinosad. This would be, you can find this in products like Captain Jack's Dead Bug Brew or Monterey Garden Insect Control. That's gonna be your organic option. Um, acephate is a non-organic option. It's gonna work really well, but it can be hard on beneficial insects. Another thing to remember is you might also see these caterpillars on, on blueberries because they'll feed on blueberries in addition to azaleas. Okay, let's talk about some rose pests. So we're gonna talk mainly about the first two in my list here, rose softfly and rose rosette. Those are the two most important and the two most common things that I see in landscapes. Armillaria root rot will also cause problems with roses, but it's, it's not as common as the first two. In this picture on the right, this is damage from the raw rose softfly. And that's the first one we're gonna talk about. You may see these called rose slugs, Okay, and many times if you've let rose slugs or rose soft flies really develop on, on, say, your knockout roses, you'll go out one day and it looks like the, something's happened. Something's sprayed on the plants. Something's going to kill the plants. The leaves are brown like this um, and seems to happen almost overnight. Well, rose soft flies or, or rose slugs, they're not true slugs and they're not caterpillars. Um, they're actually in, in the order with things like wasps and bees and ants. And so we need to treat them a little bit differently in, when we talk about trying to control them. This picture here is the bristly. We actually see as many as three different types of, of rose softflies or softflies on roses. This is the, the bristly rose slug, and it's got little hairs on it. And this is a pretty big one, but most of the time you're going to, especially early on when you're just starting to see damage, these are little tiny green larvae that are hard, hard to see, easy to miss. Um, and so you really need to check the backs of the leaves carefully. They skeletonize the leaves. They basically eat the green part of the leaf off, or they do kind of like in this picture right here. See, there's like a window pane. So they eat the green tissue off, leaving this film almost like a pane of glass. And as far as timing, about the 1st of April is when I really start looking for these. Now, in this, if we have a warm spring, start looking in the middle of March. 
And I'm gonna see them throughout May. Um, the bristly rose slug soft lines will have multiple generations. Our common rose slugs will just have one. Now, again, the damage is very noticeable. That, that picture I showed you previously, it looks really bad, but things like knockout roses will produce no, new growth and um, you really don't have any long-term damage from it. Some of the best control options and treatment options, I'm gonna recommend two things. Spinosad um, would be my first choice and, and actually three things, insecticidal soap or horticultural oil. But I really like Spinosad for trying to control uh, rose soft life. Now, you might have heard another microbial insecticide called BT or Bacillus thuringiensis. That's dipel or thuricide. Well, that works great on, on true caterpillars. And since we're dealing with soft flies, it doesn't hurt them at all. So don't use like BT. Uh, don't use dipel or thuricide if you have rose soft flies. It's not going to work. Here's some more damage. And in the center of the picture, here's two rose slugs right there, the common rose slug um, larva. And again, in their typical feeding damage. Look for this early on, treat if necessary, and you won't have to worry anything more about it. Here's the next, next and probably the most important roses, rose disease that I've seen over you know, the last 10 to 12 years. This is rose rosette. And it's really continued to be a problem in, in our area and a serious threat to garden roses. This disease is transmitted by a tiny mite called an areophyte mite. Um, there we know of two different ones. There's a main one that feeds only on roses and it picks up the virus on an infected plant and can carry it either by being carried by the wind or by crawling from plant to plant and then infecting the next rose. So it's almost like a mosquito carrying West Nile virus or Zika virus. So it's that vector that's carrying it from plant to plant. The virus, it's hard to move from plant to plant. So it's, it needs something to carry it. And in this case, it's a little tiny areified money. And they are tiny guys. They're like a hundred or one two hundredth of an inch. Um, and this isn't your typical spider mite. Spider mites that you would see on roses can't pass this virus. It's just this very specific, specific area of and mite. And in this picture, these little yellowish to almost um, orangish mites are on the stem, oftentimes right under where that leaf attaches to the, to the stem of the rose. And there's, there's probably 20 in this, this picture right here. And again, just one of those is enough to infect another rose bush. So how do I, how, how, do, how can you guys identify rose rosette? The first thing I look for, there's several things I look for. And, and the first thing is I look for red and new growth that doesn't turn green. So you have like things like knockouts and the leaves come out and they're red, but within a very short period of time, days to a week, those reddened leaves will turn green and be, be normal. Well, in this picture, you can see this red and discolored, um, distorted, ugly looking leaves on the right hand side and then the left side, these clumps of, of red and foliage and they'll stay like that throughout the season. Another real good symptom to look for is what we call witch's brooms. These are clumps of branches that, that come out of a, an area of the plant in this broom. And so here's two pictures of, of witch's brooms. This one shows up really well, easy to see. It's reddened also. Um, and in the right-hand side, you can see that witch and broom with all these gnarled branches um, all in a big clump. Also plants that are infected have excessive amounts of thorns many times. So you see in these pictures right here, you can see the infected ugly growth and see how many prickles or thorns are on there. Um, that's real indicative of rose rosette too. And probably one of the better symptoms I think for positively diagnosing the disease is look for these swollen, thickened canes. So on the picture on the right, see how the nice healthy stem comes up or it appears healthy. And then you have these side shoots coming out that are thicker than the cane that it came out of. Plus they're really thorny, they look ugly. Um, 
that really thickened stem symptom is, is real um, diagnostic for, for rose rosette. Same thing on the, on the uh, left-hand side, you get these stems that get progressively thicker as we, each new stem that, that comes out. Here's just a picture I took in Birmingham um, showing some, some rose rosette in a, in a roadside planting. You can see all of these plants are heavily infected. And once plants become he heavily infected, the most important thing to do is to remove those infected roses. And it's, it's really important to, to recognize this so that you can remove it before the mites that would be on this infected plant can go to a nearby healthy plant. And once a plant is infected with rose rosette, it's in the sap, it's moving throughout the plant, you can't cure that plant. You can't cure a, a plant of a, of a virus. And over the next year to two years, those plants that are infected will start to look really ugly. They'll have dieback. And many times they won't make it through the winter. So usually after a year, two, sometimes three years after they're infected, the plants will die. Um, and these have been in there for a while and should have been removed. So here's several points kind of about disease management with rose rosette. The first thing, know the symptoms associated with it. And I've gone over the big ones, the main ones, and just understand those and know what to look for. If you're gonna put in new roses, make sure that you space out the roses so they don't touch because you don't want those mites crawling from plant to plant that, that could crawling from an infected to a healthy plant. And I also recommend using mixed plantings, not big monocultures of, of, of shrub roses, but using roses mixed in with other non-rose plants. And, and roses are the plant or the only plant that can get rose rosette that we know of. Definitely at least maybe every three weeks, maybe every month, scout the plants and throughout the season for symptoms of rose rosette. And if you see any plants or any roses that, um, that have symptoms, at the first sign, remove that plant, including the roots, and, um, and before it has a chance to move to the neighboring um, plants in that block of roses. Now you can go back in that same spot and I would wait at least a few weeks um, some recommend one to two months before you replace a rose in that site, okay, or in that spot. Um, good thing to remember, the virus doesn't remain in the soil after you remove the plant and the roots. So I often get that question, do I need to replace the soil? And the answer is no. Um, there's no need to replace the soil as long as you've taken out the plant and the roots, you've waited a period of time before you put the new plant in, you're good to go. Now, one of the things I want to caution you about is to look around the neighborhood. Um, look at your neighbors, see if they have roses, see if they have roses that are infected with rose rosette. Because it's going to be hard if you go back with a, with a new healthy rose and just 50 feet away or 100 feet away, there's an infected rose that could spread that disease back into your landscape. So check that out before you put it in. Um, and if you have to, put in other plants. You know, things, alternatives to roses. Another thing, if you use a leaf blower, try not to use a leaf blower because you can be blowing these little tiny mites just with the leaf blower around the roses, especially if you have an infected rose. Definitely don't use a leaf blower around that because that's a great way to spread these mites from plant to plant. And the last thing, um, or the second to last thing is throughout the season, definitely carefully monitor around that plant that was removed and was infected. Okay, you, and, and, you know, you may need to remove some, some additional plants, but if you're really good about recognizing the disease and removing those infected plants, you can save the roses. I've seen big rose gardens where they've had a few plants that have been infected. And if they're really diligent about keeping up and removing infected plants, you know, these are rose gardens that have hundreds and hundreds of roses. But I've also seen plantings of hundreds and hundreds of roses that didn't really monitor it. And over a few years, even as few as two years, all of the roses in that 
those those large plantings were infected. So monitoring and, and, and scouting for this is huge. Okay, the last thing you can try is using treatments um, to reduce the spread of these areified mites. So around where that rose that removed that was infected, you can treat nearby roses. I recommend horticultural oil. You can also use another product that's been shown in research called bifenthrin. Um, that's in several different homeowner products. You can apply either of those products either on a two week schedule or every four weeks between April and September. And if you love roses, that's a, another thing that you can add to all these other things, scouting and removal of infected plants um, to prevent the disease. The only thing with horticultural oil is when we get hot, hot, follow that label directions um, to the letter as far as to prevent any chance of, of leaf burn from, from the horticultural oil. All right, let's talk about some common pests of oaks. Um, I've listed several here. We're gonna talk about a little bit about orange striped oakworm, lacanium scale, oak leaf blister, um, insect galls, and hypoxylon canker. On the right-hand side, this is a disease called Tubacchia leaf spot. I'll see this late season. And because it occurs so late in the season, I really typically don't worry about it. Um, doesn't have very much impact, it looks bad, but it is not gonna kill the plant. So again, here's my pest management cal cal calendar for oaks. Um, the orange stripe oak worm we're gonna talk about, this is late summer. So August, September are the two prime months for that, for those guys. Insect galls, pretty much growing season long. Oak leaf blister is gonna be a springtime problem starting at leaf bud through um, into June. And then Tubacchia leaf spot, like I said, this is a late season disease. We're gonna see this mid to late summer, late July, August, um, especially if we have wet weather late in the season. Okay, here's the orange stripe oak worm. And these, when the last few days before they pupate um, to turn into the moth, they are very large, over an inch long. They're black, they have two big horns on their head, and uh, they have these, these yellow to orange racing stripes down the sides. And in those last few days, they can eat a lot of leaves. If I'm scouting for them out in the garden, one of the things I'll do, I'll look at the sidewalk, I'll look at the driveway for little fecal pellets. And here's some fecal pellets that, that kind of are resting in a, uh, you can see them resting in the, in the center of this, this leaf of the, the elephant ear. So that's a sign to look up, look at the tree above. Is it in the oak? Is there any, you can see leaf damage? Do you see caterpillars? Okay, as far as treatment, most of the time on big oaks, because of their size, I typically don't treat it. These, these, oak, these uh, oak leaf, um, the orange stripe oak worms usually feed together maybe on a branch or two. In an old, you know, 40, 50 year old oak, it's not gonna cause a lot, of, a lot of damage. We have a new brand new oak that's only a year or two old, small enough to spray. Um, the dead bug, the Captain Jack's dead bug brew, um, spinosad would be, probably my first choice if it's small enough to spray the tree. And remember, we wanna catch them early when they're still small and easy to control. Okay, I, I see a lot of um, insect galls on oaks. Some of them like on the um, left-hand side, this is the horned oak gall, are hard woody galls, these big round galls that form on the stems. Um, on the right-hand side, this is the wool sower gall. And this looks like a, um, a little pom-pom about the size of a golf ball. And these are caused by um, the adults are what we call cynipid wasps. So this is the, uh, the adult for the wool sower gall maker. And um, that's what lays the eggs, which, which causes the process that forms the gall. Now the wool sower gall is only gonna be on white oak. And if you take that gall that looks a little um, like a little pom-pom and open it up, 
in the inside, you're going to see these things that look like seed. Well, those little capsules are where the larva are going to be. Um, to, I, I've never really seen more than a few on an oak tree, and it's pretty easy to just pull these off. And that's about the only thing that, that you really can do for most of these, these insect galls like that, and the, um, or the sinipid wasp galls. The first disease for of oaks um, that we're going to talk about is oak leaf blister. I see this common, and again, this is a springtime disease. I see it mainly on water oaks, southern red oaks, um, especially when we, again, when we have a cool, wet spring weather, um, when those leaves are first appearing, much like um, the azaleas in the azalea leaf gall, that's when we get infections, those cool, wet temperatures, um, cool, wet weather um, during the spring. So right about now is what you're going to see, you know, starting in May, you're going to see these, these yellow blister-like areas. They're going to be circular. They're going to be raised. So this is a southern red oak, and you can see those, those raised yellow, um, yellow orange areas of the infected or the leaf blisters. Now, as the season progresses, those, those blistered areas are going to turn brown. And you may get some leaf drop from, from this, but overall the, the appearance is of, um, it affects the appearance of the tree, but it's not gonna impact the tree health. And just the other day, I heard from a client that I told them that they had oak leaf blister and they were super worried about their tree. And, and they said they did some of the things we discussed and this year they, didn't, they haven't seen any oak leaf blister. Now, if you want to tell them a fungicide, especially on a small tree that's that spray, um, you would like to, to treat with a fungicide, timing is super critical. So right when those leaves are budding and the new leaves are coming out, that's when the spray needs to be applied. If you try to treat it, once you see these spots, you know, you're wasting your time and your money. But in most cases, especially for mature oaks, this is a disease that I, I recommend not spraying for it because again, it, it, it looks bad and it, but it doesn't affect the, uh, the tree health. You know, long-term tree health is gonna be just fine. All right, lacanium scales. These look like, this is a soft scale and you might see these little bumps on the stems. These are look like little tortoise shells stuck to the stems. Um, occasionally I'll see these, if it's just on one branch, I'll prune it out. That's a, that's a good option. Horticultural oil, um, timed, you know, in spring can, can help also. Systemic insecticides can also be a, um, an option on, on some trees. And also watch out because they're soft scales, you may get a lot of honeydew production. You're going to get some black or sooty mold. And that's another thing to look for. But there's a couple options if you run into lacanium scales, but this is going to be one that you're going to, you're going to be able to identify, uh, I think, pretty easily. And the last disease on oaks that we're going to talk about today is hypoxylin canker. Um, this is a fungal disease that's most prevalent when the trees get stressed. It typically attacks oaks, but it could be on other hardwoods too. And the stress in, in that we see in our area typically is you're going to see this after a drought. So after we had the big drought of 2016, I saw thousands and thousands of oaks go down because of hypoxylin canker. And in most cases, there were water oaks, but other red oaks also were affected and some white oaks. Now, how you um, um, diagnose this, it's going to produce this mat of fungus under the bark that's going to pop the bark off. And at first, you're going to see this tan um, fungal um, growth under the bark, and it's going to be dusty. You can see where I stuck my fingers on it, and it's going to be kind of a dusty tan. And as the season progresses, you're going to see these, these areas that are going to be silver like this or gray. And by this time, the tree is dead. Once it's in the main stem, you're not going to be able to save the tree. So the biggest prevention for this is watering during periods of drought and, and preventing the stress that, that allows the tree to become infected and damaged by hypoxylon canker. And once you see a tree like this that's been damaged, my best recommendation is as soon as possible, remove that tree, 
These trees tend to um, they'll get a sap rot that will cause limbs to fall off, branches to fall off, and could be a hazard. So I cut down these trees pretty quickly. All right, let's finish up with some miscellaneous problems. The first one we're going to talk about is um, on big leaf hydrangea that I see every season. This is just leaf spot. And I see two, sometimes three different leaf spots during the season. Cercospora leaf spot and Coronespora are the two most common um, that I see. And I see these typically June, um, mid-June, throughout the, the rest of the summer. And the preventive strategy, strategies that I use is number one, um, make sure that you have good plant spacing. So you get good air circulation and quick drying of plant tissues. Watering late in the day is a no-no. So avoid that. Water early in the morning when they're going to dry off quickly. And only water when you need to. Um, I think the third and probably one of the most important things is during the winter or before spring of leaves emerge, remove all those fallen leaves at the base of the plant. That's where this fungus overwinters on those dead leaves. And I would also apply a new layer of thin mulch, maybe an inch of, of fresh mulch to cover up any leaves that you can't get out. That's really going to delay the appearance of this disease. And then if I see some spark spots um, low in the canopy, I'm going to spray at the first sign of, of spotting, and I'm going to use probably spectrocyte immunox. Um, you can use that. You could use Garden Tech Dacanil. If you want to be um, trying organic fungicide, use this Natural Guard Copper Soap fungicide. And you're probably going to have to spray according to label directions multiple times, depending how rainy it is. But if you do all of these things, kind of like in an integrated thing, um, integrated program, I think you're going to have much fewer problems with leaf spot. The next thing we're going to talk about is the southern purple mint moth. And I see this on rosemary. So have you ever seen rosemary where you'll get these areas where they're kind of tied, the leaves are tied together with this webbing? Well, the, inside that is the caterpillars and pupa of this, this particular moth. And they feed and make these little ugly little nests on the branches and, and can make the rosemary look pretty bad. So this is the, um, the, the larva of the southern purple mint moth. And this is the adult moth, kind of a little pretty little moth. It's kind of this orangish yellow and purple. And once you start to see those, that's an idea that, that you may, if you've had this problem in the past, they're laying eggs. You're going to start seeing the, the caterpillars very soon. So that's a trigger for me. I took this picture in my backyard. When I saw that, I knew that if I wanted to, to protect my rosemary, I needed to use some treatments at that time. And for rosemary, my two options um, that are labeled for rosemary is going to be either one of the spinosad products or a BT product like Dipel or Thuricide. And I've, I've typically have used Spinosad. I think it lasts a little bit longer and is a little bit more effective. Okay, the last, one of the last ones we're gonna talk about as far as diseases in the landscape is going to be on oak leaf hydrangea. And it's gonna be one of the most common diseases of oak leaf that I see, and it's a killer of oak leaf hydrangeas. It's called armillaria root rot. You can see this picture right here is a typical plant, sudden wilt of the entire plant, it crashes and doesn't recover. And how I diagnose this problem is by peeling away the bark at the base of the plant, and you're going to see this white fungal growth between the wood and the bark, okay? And that's a positive indication of the fungus armillaria. And it, that bark is gonna have a really strong smell of mushrooms um, is another way to look at it. And once I see a plant like this, there is no cure. My recommendation is to dig up the entire plant, including the roots and replace with a resistant plant. And I can provide you guys with a, a list of, of resistant plants. Don't plant back roses. Definitely don't pack, plant back cantoniasters in those, those locations where you've had this. 
Um, another really important thing to do is avoid planting oak leaf hydrangeas in soil that stays wet from time to time and also avoid overwatering because this fungus loves soggy soil. Okay, I think we have a couple more minutes. Let's finish up. We've got a couple more things that you guys may run into from time to time. Um, parasitic plants and mushrooms. So this is dotter. It's a wholly parasitic plant that feeds on a wide variety of plants. It looks like orange spaghetti. And so I was driving through town one day a few years ago and stopped and took this picture in the landscape. This is English ivy that is just covered with this mat of dotter. And it looks again like this yellow orange strands of spaghetti. It is a plant that is in the morning glory family. And it occurs both in temperate and also in tropical locations. There's a bunch of different species of dotter. Um, in our area, there's an annual parasitic plant produces seed, seed can stay in the soil for a very long time. And then in the springtime, those seed germinate. And if there's a nearby plant that's, that's um, a host, it'll, the stem, this green, I mean, the, the, the dotter will wrap around the stem and it will penetrate and then penetrate into the vascular system of that plant to pick up the, the uh, and feed off of that plant. It has no chlorophyll, it can't make its own food. So it's a parasite um, on these other plants. And I've seen it on lantana, here it is on coleus right here. Um, I said English ivy, I've seen it on various weeds out, um, you know, we'll see on riverbanks and other places. But if you get it in the garden, it's one that, um, there are some things that we can do with pre preventative herbicides and also removing some of the infected plants. Biggest thing is you don't want this to go to seed. This is a kind of an interesting one. It's, it's got a terrible name, American Cancer Root. And it's a parasite. Again, it doesn't have any chlorophyll. This is a parasite typically on oak roots. Um, I had somebody bring this in to me the other day. And here's some pictures. You might see this probably more when you're out in, in, in the woods than you would um, typically in landscapes, but I thought it was kind of an interesting one. It's also called bear corn. And um, again, this feeds on the oak. You know, it's, it's getting all of its nutrition um, from the oak. And then it's, it's, it's popping up. And this is the, the reproductive stage of, of that particular plant. And the last one I have, um, just had one just a few hours ago, stinkhorns. These are mushrooms. Um, it's one of those, they call them stinkhorns because they smell terrible. They smell kind of like rotting meat. And you may see them in landscapes. I typically see them in damp um, areas of wood mulch. So uh, the best option to prevent them is to dry those areas out, limit irrigation. I would, you can remove the, the mushrooms themselves. This one's called, I think, the elegant stinkhorn. And on the, on the, the top of the, the mushroom, they produce this, this kind of green goo that attracts through the, the smell um, and also the, the, the green slime on the, on the top. It attracts flies and beetles that carry, this is where the spores are, and it carries the spores of this fungus to wherever that, that insect flies to next um, to basically spread this particular fungus. But this is one that if you had it in your landscape, you're definitely gonna smell it before you see it. All right, and so we're up to the question phase and this is just one more mushroom. This is um, the, uh, the, um, the weeping conch. This is a large um, fungal conch or mushroom that forms and is a wood rotter typically of oaks. Um, and this one I saw and it was about two feet across. And this is a definite danger sign that you have some serious decay in the base and the roots of this tree, which could make it more subject to wind throw. Um, so it, it's one to really watch out for. If you ever see anything like this, please contact me um, if you need any help diagnosing it. And other than that, if anybody has any questions, I would be more than happy to try to answer them. Okay. So we have a couple of questions. Um, 
in the chat and some in the Q&A. I'm going to start with the Q&A because I can dismiss those and I've been putting the ones from the chat in a Word document. Um, so let's go to the Q&A section. So Jan wants to know, is there a possibility that tick control would be addressed today? Say that again. She wanted to, I don't think you address ticks, but she wanted to know um, more about tick control. Ticks? Yes. Yeah. Um, ticks are something that I, I just don't know very much about. I don't want, um, I think there's some other things that we can definitely help you with. There's some publications that we could help you with. Um, but, you know, at this time, I don't think I can answer that one. Sorry. The next question is from Hannah. She said, can Leaf Azalea Gall also appear on a camellia? Well, there is, There's, but it's a different fungus. So there's a species of exobacidium that gets on azaleas and red-related plants. And there's a species of, of that same fungus that gets on camellias. And the treatment is the same, looks very similar. And, and it's again, just picking off the infected leaves and throwing them away. You're gonna see them at the same time period. It's gonna infect the new leaves in the springtime. Um, and again, it's, it's one that, that when we have a cool wet spring like we had this year, yeah, it's perfect weather. Um, Carvetta wants to know, are any roses resistant to rose rosette? The only one that I know so far, and they've done some big screenings of hundreds and hundreds of, of, of the known roses. And the only one that I've, I've heard of is, is one called Top Gun. It's a shrub rose. It has a red flower, um, looks similar to a knockout. Um, all the other roses that have been tested have been shown to be susceptible. So drift roses, all that are the rage right now, they, I definitely will see it in drift roses too. Um, I haven't seen Top Gun. I've seen it online. I haven't seen it in some of our local nurseries. So that might be one you can try to, um, to look for. And I think in the next few years, they're working really hard to come up with some resistant varieties. And I think in the next five years, we're going to see many more resistant varieties. And that's going to be the, the big cure for this. Okay, I'm going to go to the chat questions because we have a big question that popped up in Q&A. Um, someone wanted to know if you were going to share your slides from today. You know, I can definitely. If, if they'll email me, I'd be happy to share share my slides. I just didn't. I'm always working to the last minute on these things. I added one of the pictures just this morning, so um, I didn't forward it on to uh, to you guys. You can send it to me, and I'll include it in the email that goes out. Um, in a couple of days. Yeah, as long as people don't, you know, just keep it for their own personal use, I th I'd be happy to share it. Okay, so we answered um, a question about ticks already. Is there any suggestion for getting rid of ants in my vegetable garden? I don't want to use anything toxic, um, but they always come back to their beds. You know, it, it I, one of the questions I was asked is if they're, if they're um, what kind of ants they are and identifying mm -hmm. this kind of ants, are they fire ants or are they Argentine ants? A lot of times if we get fire ants in a, in a vegetable garden, we do have a couple organic methods. Um, spinosad is one. And if you look on the label of that product, that's an organic option. You also many times, like if it's in a raised bed and you don't necessarily want to treat inside the bed, um, these ants will forage outside of there, maybe into the grass or other areas outside. And you could use like um, the, one of the spinosa products is a, is a bait and you could use that outside of the bed in the area surrounding it. And the ants would go out, pick it up and bring it back to the mound and you get, get uh, eliminate the mound in that way. Um, do birds eat the oak caterpillars? Are there treatments that are bird safe? You know, they're, they will, they will, as far as I know. Um, you know, the trying to find something that's bird safe, you know, definitely BT, um, only 
affects, it's a stomach poison just for caterpillars, true caterpillars. And that would be, you know, a really good option. But again, you got to use it when the caterpillars are small. If you try to use it in like the picture I saw with the, you know, the larva is like an inch, inch and a half, it's not going to work. Um, and the other thing is just tolerance, you know, understanding that these are only going to feed late in the season. They're really not going to do very much damage long term. Um, and just you know, allowing a few caterpillars to be around. Uh, am I muted? No, I'm not. The next question is, how would you recognize and treat, is it trip on roses or thrip? Say again. I think it's pronounced trip, T-H-R-I-P. Yeah, thrips. Okay, okay thrips um, are very common on roses, especially feeding in the blossoms. And so at this time of the year, I'll get samples where, um, and I had one the other day on a gardenia too. And you'll peel the, the blossoms and the blossoms will get brown on the edges and then sometimes brown in the center. And you'll peel the, the petals um, apart and you'll see these little tiny insects. Or if you take the flower and just glow on the flower, you can actually, it disturbs the thrips and you can see them crawling around because they're pretty tiny. They're about the size of maybe a grain of salt or a grain of a pepper. And, um, you know, what I tell people to do is definitely the worst affected ones, just clip those off and toss them. It gets rid of the thrips that are in those. And then as soon as the buds are forming, I use um, the organic spinosad and that works really well on thrips. Um, someone wanted to know any comments on azalea petal blight. Azalea petal blight is something that I see a lot in landscapes, but the number of samples of somebody actually bringing them in is really pretty low. And it's, it's a blight of the petals. And if you've ever noticed if an azalea, um, the petals just turn brown really quickly. Oftentimes you've had petal blight. And there are some ways to, um, you know, picking up the flowers because the fungus overwinters on the flowers that have fallen off. And also there are some fungicides that we can use um, to protect the, the flowers from the petal blight fungus. Um, and, and those are the two biggest things, but it's, it's, it's always been interesting to me that it's a question that nobody answers, but I see, um, I see it quite a bit. Um, the last question I have in the Q&A is from Kirk, and he has a problem with aphids and mites on his rosemary and roses. It's a hybrid tea and climbing rose. Okay. He's been using beam oil, which seems to work, but um, he has to stay pretty aggressive with it. He prefers to use organic when possible yep. because he has a lot of pollinators, but he's open to other options. Is neem okay. oil the best first defense? You know, neem oil a lot of times is my first, is a good choice. Again, some of those um, oils, um, you know, work pretty well as long as the coverage is good. And um, Dawn, I didn't catch quite the end of that question. Maybe if I could look it up too. It should be at the bottom of your screen under the Q&A section. It should still be pulled up. And so definitely for aphids, um, I think I think if either insecticidal soap or um, neem oil or horticultural oil are going to be your best defense. Um, you know, it's they can build up very quickly, and you really got to be careful. Um, same thing with mites, like spider mites. Now, one of the things on rosemary. Um, the main things I see on rosemary, I mean, I see a lot of rosemary come into this to the lab. Occasionally, I'll see some aphids on there, but I almost never see spider mites on rosemary. So if you have rosemary that if you look at the leaves and they have this flecked appearance to them, little tiny white spots on them, most of the time when I see that, it's actually um, the mint leaf hopper. Okay. It's a little tiny insect that sucks the sap out of those um, looks. The damage would be very much similar to like spider mites, but it's, it's this little tiny leaf hopper. And 
The problem with leaf hoppers on, on that, so even if you touch the plants, and they should be around starting right now, so you might see them, just touch the plants and you'll see these bugs fly. They're kind of typically white or, you know, they're, they're gonna be light colored. Neem oil is gonna be okay, but be, since they're so active and can jump so well and are so mobile, it can be hard to control them. So it's one of those things that you just gotta keep on, um, you know, keeping, trying, to uh, continuously treat and not overdoing it, um, you know, because there are some beneficials that will also, you know, um, help to keep um, those those reduced, their numbers reduced. But that's a real toughie to control um, organically. Very hard insect to control. All right, I see one more question that says, what is the best way to prevent squash bugs? Um, I think some of the same things is, um, you know, trying to use um, some of the same um, insecticides. And that's another insect that is very hard to control, even with um, non-organic options. Um, and I think in some cases, you know, trying to differ use different rotating your insecticides, um, finding one that works. But, but once things like squash bugs really start to build up, it, it, it can be a struggle. And one of the things about squash bugs is they can spread, um, they can also spread disease. Um, there's some diseases that they can spread that, that also cause more problems. Is that the last of the questions? I think it is. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us today and giving us this presentation. I feel like you change the presentation every year and it gets better. Um, and we really just appreciate it. And we appreciate, appreciate you taking the time to answer these questions today as well. Um, everyone, we have recorded this session and we're going to edit the session as well as um, include that in the follow-up email with the survey and some more information that Dr. Jacoby has sent to us. And we hope to see y'all in two more weeks when I think the next session is going to be, Hannah just emailed me about it. What was it? Eat your landscape. So that's the next session in two weeks. So we'll see y'all then. Thanks everyone. Thanks everybody.